I hope you can hear and see us clearly. Uh, my name is Johan Gunnarsson, and I work at the Division of External Relations at Lund University uh, in the group team called International Marketing and Recruitment. And we are hosting this session here today with representatives from uh, several master's degree programs at the Faculty of Engineering. Um, today, we have a one and a half hour long session, um, and this is a very good opportunity for participants prospective students to ask questions directly to the program about things that you feel I don't understand this or I want information about that and we'll hear directly from the program representatives themselves how they feel about these questions and issues. Participants are invited to use uh, the Q&A function of Zoom to ask questions. I also have my colleague Daniel, Daniel Gunnason, same family name but not related. Um, he will uh, answer many of your questions as well in the Q&A, but most of the, you know, I could say we cherry pick questions that we want to discuss among the panelists. So without further ado, I would like to invite the panelists to introduce themselves and what they do here at Lund University. Alejandra, would you like to begin? Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alejandra. I'm the program representative for the Food Technology and Nutrition Program, and I'm an international student from Honduras. Excellent. So now, uh, according to my screen, we have Christina Windemark as the next person. Hello, everyone. My name is Christina Windemark, and I am the program coordinator for Production of Materials Engineering. And the program is about how to realize products more or less in the industry. All right, thank you, Christina. We have Michael Lentmeyer. Hello, my name is Michael Lentmeyer. I'm the director of the wireless communication program. And uh, I'm also teaching some of the courses in that program. Okay, thank you, Michael. Or oh, Michel, sorry. Louise. Hello, my name is Louise Bilsken. I'm a representative of the logistic and supply chain management program. And I am, of course, responsible for the two first courses, so fundamental of logistics and industrial purchasing. Okay, thank you, Louise. And finally, Mikael Nilsson. Hi, and I'm uh, Mikael Nilsson. I'm the program director in machine learning systems and control. And I have this cool joint with Bill Bernardson. And I made this very short uh, CV. So you can see I am an associate professor in mathematics in 2017. I have a background in signal processing, but I've also been in industry. Uh, my general interests are machine learning and computer vision. And I think that's it. OK. Thank you, Mika. Um, I would like to invite uh, participants to please use the Q&A function of Zoom to ask questions about everything related to studying uh, at the Faculty of Engineering at Lund University. Um, so we have a few of our programs represented here. There are, of course, more programs, and so maybe we can try to help each other if we, with the knowledge, the combined knowledge that we have here to help students with their questions. Um, so we have actually one, the first question, um, according to which criteria are the study places awarded only the bachelor's average? I think what kind of selection criteria do we use in our programs? Who would like to talk about the selection criteria for their programs? Christina? Yes, I can do that. I know that some programs have different, but we have both the, your bachelor degree but also a statement of purpose. So we want you to, to write a letter and, and tell us why you want to study in our program and what background you have. Um, but so the statement of purpose, according to my experience, is very useful and good. Yeah. But sometimes students, uh, they don't know what to write. What, yeah. kind of, uh, yeah. what kind of advice would you give to people who are struggling yeah. with the statement? Yes, right. so in, in our case, we really like to know why you're interested in studying the program, what you have done previously, either in if you worked in industry or in your previous courses that made you interested in the subject. Uh, and also for us to know that if it's a good fit, if you what you want to do, that it really fits into our program. So you're not get disappointed when you start. 
Okay, very well. Anyone else would like to weigh in on this very important subject? How do you select students to your programs? Uh, Michel? Well, I would say that uh, it's not the average degree, but the specific subjects that you have studied in your bachelor that matter. I think what we have to make sure is that the requirements are fulfilled. And for that, we have to look into the individual courses that you have taken and not in the average of your degree. Okay, so the GPA itself is not so important, but the grades on the courses that you, you value uh, most uh, mm -hmm. that are important for your program and wireless communication, that is what you look at. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mikael Nilsson, what would you like to say about this? Yeah, yeah, I would agree with uh, Michael's previous statement here. I mean, we have GPA, but we also have sort of more STEM courses, more courses related to our program. And that weighs maybe a bit more, but we look at both of them. So it will be a holistic view. Uh, and not only one of them, but we look at those and the grades. And if you have some extra courses in some of the things we already have, maybe you have more programming and then that's a good thing. Because when we do this ranking, we see the grades, the GPA, the, the specialized courses, and all of that together we use to make this uh, judgment. Okay. Luis, would you like to say a few words about logistics? Uh, yes. Uh, for us, it's really important that we have the complete uh, applications with the application form for the logistics and the uh, supply chain management program. So that we, you, you know, uh, we know that you are, have a keen interest in us and motivate why you want to study our program. And then, of course, uh, grades are important, but to have a complete uh, um, application is really important. And then that you have those special courses that we wish for, that we have stated, like programming skills, for example, and statistics. Mm. So the entry requirements must, of course, be met uh, completely before we can even consider uh, an applicant. Alejandra, you are, are currently a student in food technology. How did you approach the application procedure? How did you provide documents, etc.? Can you give some advice to prospective students on how to do that? Yeah, so each program has their own requirements, as everyone was saying. So as far as I know, what I was told by my academic coordinator is that as long as you fulfill the requirements uh, and also write the statement of purpose and have a good English level, you're good to go. So that's that's how I approached it. Just fulfill the requirements stated on, on each course's page. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's important to note that all the programs have uh, unique entry requirements as well. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. if they are applying to more than one program, they have to make sure that they fulfill all the Yeah, yeah. make sure that you check each course's requirements and make sure that you fulfill them. Okay, so I hope that Charlotte helps you with uh, how uh, they what they look at when they admit students. Um, we have here a program, uh, sorry, a question from Myanmar. Um, a person finished their Bachelor of uh, Science in Electrical Engineering at Coventry University in the UK. My question is, I would like to do the Master in Sustainable Energy Engineering. Would I be eligible for that program? Um, is anyone, any of the panelists familiar with the Sustainable Energy Engineering program? It's a rather new program, actually, um, that we have here. If you just look at the entry requirements, I can see you need a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, civil engineering, environmental engineering, or the equivalent. Now, of course, <laughs> when we use the term or the equivalent, it can mean quite a lot of different things. Uh, but your major here, electrical engineering, is actually not listed. So I think I would like to advise you to write an email to the program representative to ask if they accept applications from students with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. We have a question uh, about the program in production and materials engineering. I see that the entry requirements state that 20 ECTS in calculus must be obtained. 
I currently have a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Eindhoven University of Technology. At this university, I have obtained five ECTS in basic calculus courses and all other calculus that I took was part of other more specific courses. For example, the course solid mechanics included tensor uh, calculus, etc. I'm not sure how to prove that I have 20 ECTS in calculus since the courses are not named as such. We have a comment about this uh, in from Christina, I think. Yes, and this yes. is, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is quite hard to to assess, but I would recommend you to post the the course syllabus for the courses that you believe are fulfilling the requirements. Uh, post the the course syllabus for us so we can look at them. And so so in cases where it's hard for it just to look at the transcript and see yeah. what the what the student has taken, uh, it it's good it's a good idea to submit yeah. the syllabus as well. Yeah. I think that is good. Okay, excellent. Very good. Um, we have a more kind of general question here, I suppose, but maybe you can all weigh in. Uh, hello, Johan. Thanks for hosting. May I ask what is the typical class size for a master's program at Lund? If we can look at the engineering programs here, uh, Michael, Mikael Nilsson, uh, how many students do you admit every year and how many typically join your class? Uh, well, I have one course in machine learning, and I have quite a lot. I have had uh, 130 registered uh, last time. So that's quite a large group, I would say. It's very popular right now. I think other courses are more like sort of 50, maybe 60, because you join the, the Swedish civil engineering programs typically on most courses. Uh, on the other hand, if you go to our introduction course, it's sort of only for our masters. So that, that's a very small, like, 20 or so then, but there, there are quite uh, quite many students in my uh, program. So what you're saying is that the, if you apply for a master's program like uh, the, the machine learning, maybe it's 20 something students, but they will actually take courses with uh, students from other programs. So the, the classes will be quite large sometimes. Yes, yes, definitely so. Okay, uh, Louise, how many, how many students do you typically uh, admit to the logistics master? Uh, we admit like 50, but uh, this year only six. We only have six students in the program, but they also study uh, with the Swedish students. So the classes can be quite big uh, when you combine all the different, uh, from different uh, educations. So it could be like 80 uh, people in the class, but from the master program, it's just like six. So the first course, introductory course, is a very small class, maybe just 10 students. Okay. Um, Alejandra, how many classmates do you have in the food technology program? So we are like half and half, we're around 45. Swedish and international. So I'm, I'm, I don't have like the right number as of now, but I'm thinking we're like international, we're like 23 and Swedish, it's also around that number, 23 or 25. Okay. Yeah. Can we hear from Christina Windmark on your program, Production and Materials Engineering? Yes. We aim to, to take in about 20 to 25 students every year in our master program. Uh, the last two years due to Corona, we have a little bit less, so we are about 14, 15 uh, students. And if we combine it, because some of the courses, we have a lot of Swedish students, and in some courses, it's not as many Swedish students. So I would say that an average on about 30 to 40 students per class. Okay. Something like that. And finally, Michelle? Uh, for wireless communication, how many do you admit every year? Well, the target is also 20 to 30 students for us, but yeah, it's the same. The last two years with Corona, it, it was going down, maybe uh, 15. And uh, the classrooms are bigger in some courses. We also have shared courses. The first course in digital communications has about 70 students. We do that together with other programs. But uh, yeah, it's, it's the same as we have heard. In some classes, there are almost only master students and then it's a small group. 
or you're specializing in electives where you have a small number of students that choose this particular subject, but the mandatory courses typically have more other students in them also. So I, I'm quite interested in this question that you mentioned with elective courses. Uh, to all of you panelists, um, how can students in your program shape their own kind of path uh, through selecting their courses that they are interested in? And how many courses are mandatory? Is it 50-50 or is it 20% mandatory and 80% elective? Or is it what kind of route? Do you see in your programs? Well, maybe, uh, yeah. I want to start uh, for us? We have relatively many compulsory courses. We have a program that is shaped very directly for wireless communications, and only three elective courses and nine compulsory. So it's a quite uh, well controlled uh, program. I would say. Mm -hmm. Alejandra, can you describe uh, in your program how many courses are so-called mandatory and how many are electives? Uh... Yes, so for the first semester, I know we take two mandatory and then each semester we have to take one mandatory and one elective. Uh, we don't have a lot of options for electives like as Swedish students do. But uh, you can focus on, for example, there are environmental and sustainability courses that you can take. Um, so you can choose those over something more focused on food technology or nutrition. I think, uh, Mikael Nilsson, your program has two tracks, doesn't it? So if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I can give you this uh, image even if you can see what I'm sharing now. So it's, it has two tracks. One is more machine learning focus, another one has uh, control theory. And uh, on both of them, we have elective courses. It's either four in the machine learning track or five in the control track. And all of these elective courses, we have 30 something different courses with technical nature, signal processing, other programming courses and things like that to choose from where you can build together. So you, you have roughly a half a year of these two years here that you sort of building yourself. And you can see the green ones are the mandatory, uh, the blue one are for the tracks, and the yellow ones are elective courses, as you can see here. So the elective courses uh, are still, it, they have to be relevant for, for the program, I assume. Yes, exactly. So we have picked, handpicked 30. We tried to find as many as possible, but we think are reasonable. So we have 30 something courses within LTH in technical nature a lot of techni uh, technical uh, focus. Uh, but of course, we are open. If, if some student comes and say that this one is relevant, we will have a look at it also. OK, that's good. So yeah, just to explain to our audience members that LTH that Michael uh, will refer to is uh, the Swedish acronym for <laughs> Faculty of Engineering, Lund University Faculty of Engineering. Um, Luis, uh, and the logistics program, uh, how does it look there? How many mandatory and elective courses do you offer uh, students in the program? So uh, the first year is quite uh, a lot of mandatory courses, but we have one elective courses towards the end of the second semester. Um, and then you can choose uh, different kinds. So you can choose operation strategy or business process management in that uh, period. And then the second year is more elective before you start the master thesis. So then you only do the project and research methodology course, and then you choose three elective courses. And there you can choose packaging logistics, simulations, supply chain information system, quality management, and humanitarian logistics. So that's so four elective courses in total on the whole education, and the rest is the mandatory compulsory courses. Mm -hmm. Christina, would you like to describe the situation in production and materials engineering? Yes, we, we have um, decided to have about 60 credits that are mandatory. And then we have 30 credits that are elective, and then 30 credits are the master thesis project. Uh, so the first, the first semester we have mandatory courses, and after that you can select one elective courses per study period. So in one year you have four study periods. 
so in, in total, that means that you could uh, select four, four courses that are elected. Uh, we have put some elective courses uh, that we have said are, are fit for our program well, but we are also open for that if you have, a, 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 say, a course at the Faculty of Engineering that you're really interested in taking, we are open for discussions for that. Okay, so if a student can find a course that is yeah. not on your list, then yes. you can still discuss it. Like, yeah. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. the, the important is that you need to look at what, I say, because many courses have some prerequisites that you need to fulfill, and you still need to fulfill them. So even if you are, have, I say, a place in our program, you still need to fulfill the requisites for the course. So uh, it's not only for us to say yes, it's also the, the ones that provide the course that need to mm. say yeah, that's a very good point. It's almost like you're when you're applying for single subject courses, there are still entry requirements and you must meet the requirements. Yeah. Um, so we have actually a question to Mikael Nilsson. Um, hello, the machine learning program requires applicants to have a background in automation. And I wonder if the course digital circuit would meet this requirement. Is that something you can speak to? Is it uh, for change for control theory? Um, I just read the question as it, yeah, as it I, was uh, written. I so. think the answer is no, if it's specifically asking, if the student is specifically asking for if it can replace control theory, then I think the answer would be no. Okay, so control theory is essential. Yes, and my other um, colleague is from control department that could say it definitely, but I think he will say the same thing as I would do now. Mm. Would it be possible for this student to contact you and just to get this kind of confirmed? Yes, if, if it's specifically the control theory course, mm -hmm. it's better to contact Bill Bernason. He's also on the web page together with me because he makes the decision on the control theory questions. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, so we have a question about the virtual reality and augmented reality master program. It, we unfortunately do not have a representative from that program um, today here with us. Uh, but the question is about the virtual reality and augmented reality master's program. Would this program be useful to those who already have experience in this field of technology and are finishing their bachelor's degree? Well, I... <laughs> You, you, we have the entry requirements of the program, of course, and those must be met, first of all, uh, in order for us to consider you. Uh, and then what can we, the panelists, try to describe generally what it means to take a master's? I mean, because when they enter your master's program, they must have some foundational knowledge with them already. And the master's degree will enable them to learn at a more advanced level, right? Justina, can you say a few words about that? Why is it important to have a matching background or, or a, a certain background to enter a master's degree? I would say that it's, uh, if I understand this question, it's about that even if you are overqualified or underqualified, because of course you could have taken a lot of courses that are already in the master program. And that could of course be a, a, a complicated issue. But the, the thing is also that you, you need to have some courses in order to be able to follow the education, because we will not talk about the basic things. We, we will assume that you know the fundamental uh, in each of our different uh, how say main subjects in, in the master program. So, for example, in my case, we had a few, you need to have some, some knowledge about the technology in the processes in, in the industry, for example, and you need to have some material background and know what our material uh, structure is and so on. But we doesn't I say assume that you have a lot of knowledge, just that you have a basic knowledge that we can build on. And if you look at the master program, this is all about utilizing your knowledge. Yes, we will provide you with new knowledge, but you are the ones that are responsible for actually learning. We will not give you a recipe. Here, learn this, and then you are, are finished. It's, it's uh, I say, a lot about your yourself and how you want to develop. Uh, that should be in the focus. Okay, thank you. Um, we often get the question from students, prospective students, how much, how much is theory and how much is application in the, in the master's program? How much focus is there on application? How much focus is there on theory? Would you like to describe the situation in some of your programs? 
there are a lot of practical elements in many engineering programs, I, I would assume. Michel Lentmeyer? Well, I would say that uh, you need a solid mathematical foundation in order to do a good practical work in our field. It's, it's required that you have good background. You start the program courses with more theoretical courses that go a little bit deeper into mathematical details also, and then later go to broader subjects where, where you have more of a system-wide knowledge. And then we have a more practical course, the wireless project where you are doing some software, you, you actually build some software for a, a real wireless communication link and see how it works in practice. So as I think all elements are important. Uh, we work a lot together in research with companies, but uh, you know, the practical parts are not themselves the most uh, challenging thing. It's mostly applying it to the, to the field itself and, and having the right background for, for being able to start with it. That is very important. Here we hear from Alejandra in your experience, the program, you have been in, in the food technology program now for a bit more than a year. Of course, this has been, the past year has been very unusual in many ways, but do you have a feeling for how much you, you sit down and you know learn from books as it were, and how much do you get your hands dirty in, in the lab or any other environment that requires more practical um, work? Yeah, I would probably say it's around half and half because the, depending on which courses you choose, right? Because obviously like you have the theory, but the theory you obviously have to put it into practice, right? For example, if you take food microbiology or probiotics, um, you know, food technology, colloidal chemistry, all of these have labs, or if you take the dairy course, all of them have laboratories. Uh, but then last year when we can go to the labs, we had a bunch of at home labs where we did you know, fermentation, baking, all these things. So even though we couldn't go to campus, we still were able to put these things into practice. So to answer your question, it's around half and half, depending mm. on what courses they take. Yeah. But now you're back fully on campus. I, I yes. yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 we're fully on campus and we're actually taking a mandatory course, which is 15 credits. And we have to go to the laboratory and do tests to create a new product. So it's a lot of fun. Mm, excellent. Uh, Mikael Nilsson, would you like to describe the experience in your program? Is... Yeah, I, I think I agree with Michael before. I mean, we need this mathematical foundation to do things. And then uh, we have a, maybe a bit more theoretical parts in some courses, but also like the pendulum in control theory, where you actually do and do algorithm and, and try it on a physical thing. And more programming, if you work with a company on your thesis, for example, you have more hands-on programming. So I, I think the focus is a bit more on theoretical, but you will be able to use that in, in practical scenarios, uh, often in the thesis work uh, a lot. Mm. Uh, Luis, would you like to describe logistics and supply chain management? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit same as uh, Mikael said, that uh, we, uh, we teach different concepts uh, that should be applied in reality in companies. So most uh, students do their master's thesis in collaboration with companies. And uh, most of, uh, a lot of our international students start working in Sweden after their master's thesis. So we try to uh, give the students uh, the, uh, uh, an education that is practical, that can be used uh, in, in practice uh, very much in industry. So industry is our lab in, in uh, logistics, you could say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Christina, would you like to say a few words about that? Yes, I could say that we have some different type of courses. I would say that maybe a little bit more than half the courses include both theory and practice. So it's not either of uh, where we try to I say, use the theory and, and show examples, the labs and so on. And then, of course, we have some courses, for example, that I'm teaching that are we doesn't do labs, but we try to do more reflective I say, assignments or reflective work about the content. So not only learning the content, but try to see how could we apply this for a real case or how could we apply it in the industry and what is the pros and cons. 
uh, with, with the theory and so on. So I would say we have some courses that are purely practical, but we also have some courses that are more purely theoretical, but they are theoretical in order to, to later on do, use it in practice. So a uh, quite practical program. Mm. So be prepared for both. Yes. Uh, as the Lund University motto is, you have both theory and practical. Uh, I would like to again invite participants to, when they have questions that they would like to ask the panelists, please use the Zoom Q&A function to write your questions and we'll do our best to handle them. But I want to bring something up that I think we get quite a lot of questions about and you, several panelists, have already kind of hinted at it or mentioned it in your, in your talk so far, and that is kind of collaboration with industry. Um, how in engineering, how important is kind of an active dialogue and collaboration with private sector, I assume, industry? Um, what we have pretty strong collaboration at Lund University with companies and organizations that are based in our in our town. Um, Mikael, what would you like to say in, in your program? How much? How much collaboration do you see uh, with industry and companies? Um... Yeah, I, I can mention that we had recently uh, sort of a meeting with for two last year, the master students with uh, 12 companies, where the companies came to a lecture and gave a five minute pitch. What we see sort of, this is something we, we want help with, someone with your background. Uh, and then they are open sometimes to internships and sometimes more to thesis works. Uh, I think quite often it's, it's thesis works they are looking for, but also internships. But it's also company, but also this new Max4 and ESS, the new uh, physics labs that are uh, building up here in Lund. We have students been working at the Max4 lab, for example. They're also seeking this kind of competence. So I think it, it's important and it's important also as a student to be active and looking around uh, during your studies and you will uh, bump into uh, companies during your studies, whether you like it or not. And, and it's up to you to catch those opportunities what emerge, I would say. Hmm. What would you say, Michael uh, Lentmeyer, wireless, uh, how, how much do you collaborate with industry? In Actually, quite a lot. We have many research projects, big research projects with, for instance, Ericsson here in Lund, which are in the context of 5G and beyond and wireless standard, uh, doing a lot of activity now with uh, new methods. Uh, massive MIMO is the term that is coming up a lot. This is a new way of uh, increasing the data rates of a mobile system. And Ericsson here in Lund is very active at that. They have test base stations that we can even connect to with our own hardware test equipment and things like that. So there's a lot going on, but I would say this is more at the level towards the end. Yeah, degree projects maybe not earlier. It's not like you can do internships where you get easily hands-on. You need first to go through the program to come to the level that you can really uh, contribute to these things. But we, we have a lot of research projects together. We've got the Sony is also in Lund. Uh, we have smaller companies that are spin-offs of this, uh, Sigma connectivity. There, there is mobile cars is getting more and more interested in communication systems or also positioning, which is very closely connected to communication. So we work also on localization of, of cars and things like that. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. Alejandra, what is your take so far? You, uh, Michael was suggesting that it's more like towards the end of the masters that, where it's uh, where the skills and knowledge that you have gained in the program can be useful for industry. Or is that your feeling as well? That uh... Yes, so I'm not very familiar with how it works, but as far as I know and as far as I've perceived, um, you know, we have many guest lecturers from the industry and also most of the projects from the food tech program are also per performed at industries. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming there is a very close relationship with the program. And also internships aren't mandatory, but you're welcome to do one if you want to, yeah. Is that instead of a elective course? No, 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 it's not in our syllabus, but like, for example, if you want to do one in the summer 
-hmm. or if you want to do one in addition to your courses, you can do that, but it's not, it's not a requirement for us, but I know some people did it, for example, in the summer. Okay. Yeah. So that's very good to get some uh, actual work experience as well yeah. in there. Uh, Christina, for production materials yes. engineering, how much do you collaborate with industry and we companies? We collaborate a lot. For example, we have eight affiliated person at our department that are in the industry or um, at the ESS. The eight person is from ESS, the European Spelling Source, that we do a lot of material research with. Uh, so they are, some of them are included in our courses, so they do less guest lectures or lectures. Um, we have really good collaboration when it comes to master thesis. Unfortunately, last year was not a good year for industrial master thesis, but we can already see this year that we are going up to almost the same levels as before the pandemic in industrial master thesis. Uh, so, um, yeah, you will have a great opportunity to meet the industry. Uh, in, in our program. Louise, would you like to say a few words for logistics and supply chain management? Um, yeah, we have uh, guest lectures in our courses and then we have projects where you interview, for example, a purchaser about and prepare to a theory. And uh, you have projects in most courses uh, that should be uh, uh, easy to uh, like uh, to get you into practice. It's like to practice what you you learn in theory. So and uh, then of course the master thesis project is most often done with, together with a company or at a company. And uh, between the first and second year, uh, a lot of students get summer jobs in logistics uh, in Sweden also mm. of the master students. All right, that's excellent. We have a, a question from Valentin uh, directed at Mikael Nilsson. Question for the machine learning systems and control uh, program. Could you provide an example of, of a program thesis projects and research? Is it possible to get a PhD after studies? Uh, I think there are two questions here, really. So uh, research uh, that is conducted at the Faculty of Engineering, how does that connect to the, the master's program? So I, I think most of the personnel you're meeting in your courses have some kind of research, uh, a lot of them. So what you typically do during your studies is you, you reach out for them and, and you see what their sort of research topic we are going and, and that's if that's interesting for you. And, and if you start digging around, there's a system where you can find old thesis works. Um, I can't find the link right now, but you can find it, but you can look in, in typically a lot of, uh, for example, control theory thesis works and uh, deep learning uh, thesis works and how they look. And, and many of them are joined with companies and some are a bit more uh, theoretical. All right. Um, so we have kind of a more general question to all of you. For students of engineering, after they finish a master's program in LEARNED, uh, how likely is it that they will get uh, an opportunity to join a, a PhD program? Um, do you, I don't know if you have any numbers of how many typically join a PhD program either in LEARNED or somewhere else, and how many just kind of uh, start looking for regular work, maybe in the private sector. Uh, is there anyone who would like to explain the situation? I can say we have one class that uh, has finished, so we, it's our third year we have our program. And from a class of 33 students, two have PhD positions, or student position at the moment. Uh, but I would say it is really up to the individual person. Uh, it's not only the skills in related to courses and so on. It's it's it needs to be a good personal fit, also for the PhD programs. But then also it's all about finding funds for PhD positions. Some year we could have several PhD positions. Some year non PhD position. It, I guess it's the same for all different departments, uh, both outside Lund and in Lund. Mm. Uh, Michael, what's it like at uh, Wireless? How many of your students typically go on to or stay in academia uh, after they finish the master? Well, I, I can't really say numbers 
here, but I can say many of our PhD students we hire come from this project, uh, from this program. Uh, and uh, also there are many that if they perhaps cannot get a position here, do it somewhere else in Europe or outside Europe. We have people who went to Spain, for example, several of them. I know we have some people that did their PhD in France afterwards. So, so certainly what you learn here is in principle good for doing an academic career, but of course it depends as, as Christina said on your personality, if this suits you, if you, I mean, not everybody is made for an academic career. It is um, a certain uncertainty also in doing an academic career, of course, because you have to find in the long term uh, a continuation of funding for things that you're doing and so on. But I would say that in Sweden, the conditions as a PhD student are excellent, but the number of positions is limited at, at each time. So it is. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, because we can only take PhD students on when we actually have funding, as I think exactly. Christina mentioned, and then we will advertise the position openly, uh, of course. Um, Alejandra, I have a question here. Maybe it's too early. For, I don't know how much you started thinking about your career after you finished the master's degree program, but there is someone who is asking, after graduating from food technology, how is the career opportunity where could postgraduates work? Do you know what the, the graduates from your program, what types of positions and companies do they often work in? Um, I'm not very familiar, but uh, you know, food technology is very broad. So we've been told in courses, you know, that people end up working probably at the food industry or even pharmaceutical industry. And uh, some of the statistics from the program show that 90% of the graduates find job within a year. Um, so that's pretty good statistics, but, but it entirely depends on what you want to focus on. You know, if you want to keep working probably in like, you know, functional food development or, you know, so many things that you can focus on quality microbiology. So it entirely depends on what you want to focus on. But there are many opportunities as far as I know, and I would like to think. <laughs> mm. Is yeah. there a specific focus at the department where you are doing your uh, your master's program? Is there a, any special area? You said functional foods, for instance, uh, and stuff like that. Is that a hot subject right now in food technology uh, circles? Well, yeah, I, I think so, because, you know, there's a rise in non-communicable diseases like obesity and diabetes. So in order to tackle these and like offer better products, um, there's a lot of focus on, on these types of foods, like functional foods. Um, also like the vegan trend, you know, like providing more food that's more plant-based uh, is on the rise. So yeah, mm. there's not like in the, in the program, there's not like a focus on these things specifically. But I would assume like if you want to do more research in this, like you can approach a teacher and you could go into this also for an advanced course um, on your third semester. Yeah, and the food, there is quite a lot of food production uh, happening in southern Sweden, isn't there? I mean, it's uh, one of the most fertile uh, places to grow food, for instance, in, in all of Sweden. Yes. So Yes, and also there's a lot of innovation here and a lot of support. And also, for example, if you want to go into probably like creating your own food product, there's a program from Lund University, which is called Venture Lab, and they support startups. So they help you start your own, yeah, start up your own company if you, if you so wish to. Mm. Um, I'm in that program because I want to develop a probiotic chocolate. So th there are many possibilities. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, here we have a question for Louise. Uh, there is a person who was accepted last year to the logistics and supply chain management. Uh, sadly, I had to reject the offer because I failed to secure a scholarship. Now I'm applying for the same program again because there's no other program that is better suited to my interest except here at Lund University. I wonder if my past decision of rejecting the offer will affect the selection and admission result for my next application. Uh, Louise, do you understand the question? 
Yes, yes. It's just to um, apply again. And if you were selected last year, you have a good chance to be selected this year. Just make sure you get your application complete and updated and send it in in time. So then it, 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 you should be okay. Yeah, we don't we don't keep a blacklist <laughs> for mm -hmm. so just apply again like Louis suggested and update your documents, of course. Um, we have a question for the production and materials engineering program. I would like to know an example of a thesis project in the production and materials engineering program. I'm really interested in studying the recycling process of electronic waste. I'm wondering if production and materials engineering is the right path for me. Okay, I, I would say that this, this is a subject that we're coming more and more into. Um, we have had similar projects, it's not electronic waste, but we have one a student that was looking at the, the recyclability of grey cast iron and the machinability due to the recycled material, for example. So he, he did some studies um, and both looking at the characteristic of the material, of the machining process, and then have some literature study related to what, what, what does the academia say about the recyclability of grey cast iron. So that is one, one example of a, of a master thesis that we have done. Um, we also have a new PhD project that will start uh, this, uh, this spring, and it will be a follow up of, on, on this piece of, say, thesis uh, and looking more into cast materials and the re recyclability of cast materials in general. Um, I would like to ask all the panelists if there is a sustainability uh, angle to all programs that we are offering yes. and to what de degree mm -hmm. thinking about sustainability has kind of influenced the, the way we offer the programs and what we offer. Yeah. Um, Can I continue? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, because yeah. then I go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, so I could say that the sustainability is quite an important part in, in many of our courses. We have two courses on sustainability sustainable production systems and it's about understanding both the, the processes what do we need and also the sustainability part but the efficiency is also important when we look at production for example and understanding materials how do we utilize materials in a good way was 80 percent of the of most of the impact that coming from the materials not the processes in of in itself when we when we're ending coming to the end of the product so yes we have we have a lot of sustainability in in the courses i was unfortunately say not a lot about electronic waste uh, but uh, there is sustainability in the program mm -hmm. Luis, what can you say for logistics and supply chain management? Is sustainability uh, an issue that you deal with uh, a lot in your program? Um, we don't have any particular courses in sustainability, but we try to angle our courses so we at least have some uh, something. We say something about sustainability in each course, and some uh, master students have done. Uh, um, uh, their master projects at IKEA, measuring the CO2 in the supply chain. So they have been very focused on sustainability. So we have had a lot of master theses or in that area, but we don't have a particular course in it. Right. So it's more uh, if students are interested in this, they can choose to to do something with it, as it were. Yeah. yeah. Yes, they can. Mm -hmm. Uh, Michael Lentmeyer, uh, do you have any su sustainability angle in your program, or is it well? Is it it's maybe it's difficult to to directly say seeing this in courses, uh, but I, I would say energy efficiency is very important for communication systems, especially when they grow, and we have to of course put a lot of thoughts in how we manage that, and 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 then another aspect to it is also that the connected systems will help improving, for instance, smart cities in doing monitoring of environments and things like that. So we can say we are pro providing tools also for helping doing, uh, achieving sustainability uh, in, in other applications. So, so I think this is actually something where also our department is uh, starting big projects now in, into looking into 
smart cities and how wireless technology can help improving life around us. Things like that. I would expect there is more to come. I don't think that right now we are at the end of these questions. Okay. Uh, Michael, uh, would you like to just say a few words about the sustainability angle uh, though, for the machine learning program? Is this something that is incorporated in your uh, learning at, in this program? I would say it's similar to Michael. It's sort of indirectly related because we want to make sense of data. So for example, in a smart city, if we can make a sense of it more smart, we can make more efficient decisions to control things. Or we have a recent research project that's sort of in that vein also where we look at farming and how should you treat your, your fields in order to have a most efficient, uh, not um, tying down carbon dioxide and things like that. So I think it's, it's not explicit in the course, but it's implicit when you're controlling things and you try to measure them to make decisions in the future to control that kind of things. So the knowledge and skills you learn in the programs can be used for, for this application. Yes. Yeah. So we have actually a question here about ESS because some of you uh, panelists have already mentioned ESS and uh, it says, uh, or they say in the previous webinar, they stated that ESS will officially open in 2023. Uh, is it possible for students studying production and materials engineering to work as an intern uh, at ESS? And can they apply for a job at ESS after they finish uh, their program? I would say that it's not, uh, I say it would be possible. Uh, I think we had students doing, uh, I say, summer job or working their part time at the Max 4. It's not ESS, but ESS as Max 4 is uh, up and running. And I, we have a lot of research collaboration with ESS. So at least most, I say master thesis topics could be possible to do at ESS. It's all about what and how and so on. It, it's really hard to say exactly what we can do. But as we have one affiliated at the department at ESS, I see a, a good opportunity. Yeah. So e ESS, we may want to tell uh, the audience again, is European Spallation Source, of course. We use the acronym ESS, European Spallation Source. And even though it hasn't been actually inaugurated, there is a lot of work going on with yeah. this uh, research uh, uh, infrastructure uh, that we are constructing here in Lund. Uh, is there anyone else who want to weigh in on ESS and the collaborations with the Faculty of Engineering or the departments that you, that you are aware of? Not really? Okay, so let's move on from ESS. Um, so we have actually a question came in before this session. It's more about student life. And I would like to ask Alejandra to kind of describe student life. What does a typical day look like for a faculty of engineering student? Um, so it entirely depends on your courses, but I would say, you know, like in a week, it's just like 40 hours of study time on your own time and also, you know, attending courses or seminars or labs, whatever it is. So um, 40 hours. Um, and then you have to have a balance between studies and also free time. So there's a lot of things to do in the city. There's a lot of cozy cafes. There's a lot of activities organized by the nations. So if you don't have a balance, it's, it's very hard to keep up with the study pace um, because the master programs are very demanding. Yeah. Yeah, I think we got we had another webinar a while back and I asked the panelists to explain the difference of kind of studying at bachelor's level and then at master's level if there is a huge uh, kind of difference in difficulty or uh, you know, what do you say, Alejandra? Is it what is different bachelor's compared with master's level studying? Uh, is it a completely different game? Yeah, yeah. I think honestly, it's it's totally different. Uh, you 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 have to put m I think more effort, and also here in Sweden, the education system is probably different than what most of us are used to. Uh, because, for example, in my bachelor's, it wasn't it was mostly you know like I had this thing to do and I did it on my own. But here in Sweden, it's very important to have teamwork. So 
uh, for example, for my courses, everything is in teams. So you don't have, you don't, you won't do one thing on your own. It's a bunch of people always working together. So I think that's really great, but it's also very demanding. Um, it, it's, it's completely different from your bachelor. So get ready, but it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, your group work is a is a feature of, of higher education in Sweden, I would say, and many people say that this is not something that they were used to from from their home country, perhaps, where it's more like individual reading, possibly. Uh, but what do you see, uh, if we can ask for the program, what do you think the benefits are of the kind of rather high emphasis on group work in, in, in Swedish universities, Louise, what are the benefits for students? Uh, what do we think? Why why is there so much group work in, at Swedish universities? Um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's good to 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 practice to work in teams when you're going to work in companies, so you get used to it and perhaps uh, work with different people. So and also you can learn from each other, and it's it's a, a good. Uh, um, uh, it, it's it's better than being isolated by yourself. I think it's more it's nicer to be in a group to work together. Mm. And then when we speak of master's level in your master's programs, they have a lot of international students uh, yeah. so who come from um, different backgrounds, different education systems, and different cultures, etc. Um, is it easy or difficult for them to get used to group work? What do you say, Christina, in your experience? I would say that it's, um, I have just positive sides of group works. We also do a lot of group works in, in our program. Uh, and I would also say it's not only about learning to work in groups, it's also have to have someone to reflect with because a lot of the information and knowledge that you gain in your master courses, it's not like there's one truth. It's everything is, is, a, is a scale of different types of gray. And it's all about to know when, when does it actually fit into specific problems? When should I select another solution and so on? And to work in groups makes it a lot easier to do this reflection together than to sit by yourself and, and reflect. Uh, Michael Lentmeyer, what's your take on this? The group work, uh, is it common in your program? I would say we have a lot of group work where people work in pairs or smaller groups and not so much on very big groups. So. But, but it is very common to do some hand-in projects together. Uh, I think it is, a, a, to the earlier term, talking about how, how is student life, how does it look like? When I, one thing I should mention is that people always say that it, it sounds first very strange that you have only two courses in parallel. I mean, we, we have only two courses running at the same time. But, but then we have very short study periods. I think this is a big difference to other countries as well. When people got, get surprised, they maybe come from a bachelor with eight courses in parallel. Then they come to us, they have just two subjects and think, oh yeah, this is cool. I can do a lot of things in parallel, but then it doesn't work because, oh, suddenly we are already at the end of the term, the exam is coming all the time. You have to do hand in homeworks. You have to do projects. You're busy all the time. I think this is what, what is quite unusual. And, uh, and this is what people have to get used to when they come from other places. Thank you. Mikael Nilsson, do you have a take on this? Is there a lot of emphasis on group work in your program? Yeah, it, it's uh, quite some, but it's a mixed ball. Some courses have more individual work, or maybe some individual exam and other uh, or sort of teamwork. But I think also what's worth mentioning, it's building a good group within the master program. The students there are typically getting at least in, so far in our experience, a quite tight group because they have this introduction course together, only the, the master students. So they sort of forming a quite tight group, which I think it's important. And I think it's important to have that with you when you're thinking about getting work also, because as someone mentioned here, you will probably work in a, in a team and not alone when you go out in industry. Yeah, and also working these days in many, at least private sector companies, there is a multinational clear multinational, I mean, teams are, they can come from all over the place, right? And if you already have experience dealing with people from different cultures and backgrounds, 
I see that as a huge advantage, I would say. Do you agree, Alejandra? Yes, completely. I agree with everything that's been mentioned. Uh, as I said, like before getting here, I wasn't used to working in groups, but I've learned so much from other people because, you know, I'm, I'm probably not good with like managing costs and stuff like this, but like other, like another person is. So like we complement each other and like we have different experiences, people that have worked in the industry or people that, you know, have done other master programs. It's, it's amazing to work in groups and I highly appreciate it here. Yeah. All right. Thank you. We have one open question. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. A question concerning the machine learning master. Would you be able to describe some of the stated master theses in cooperation with industry uh, to get a feeling about the topics where the knowledge from the master is applied? Uh, is there a student who has done? Yeah, here we go. PPT. Uh, I, let, let me put it like this. We have not yet had any master work with our master students because our new program is new. They are doing their master thesis this spring. But what I can show you now here is three or four examples from uh, Swedish students that goes a program that have the same focus, okay? So just to make this clear. But these are, these are examples together with companies that they did something uh, in machine learning that I myself supervised. So just to get the context, this is kind of a thesis work I'm envisioning and it will be similar as what Swedish students are doing, okay? But, but has a specialization in machine learning on those programs. This was Amy Lynn Ulle. They, they looked uh, together with Bill Technique on uh, videos from operations, real operations. And they did a lot of things with uh, CNNs to try to find out different events in operations because this company wanted to give a condensed video because we have eight hour videos and I want to condense them down to the important moments when we have a surgery to look at them afterhand. And they did uh, several tools here, machine learning with CNNs, convolutional neural networks. They did object detection to find some specific tools in the video. They did some optical flow, more computer vision to do some analysis. They also did some more simple uh, engineering, I would say, on the machines that are connected to the person being operated. To give you some, another example, uh, this was a bit more uh, together with the food technology researchers that we sort of speculated if we have uh, this uh, plate with food, could we estimate the calories if we make it uh, fairly controlled? So uh, John Henry Marco looked at different ways to do segmentation of the foods and do correlation to the calories for different uh, food uh, that will be served. Uh, another example would be uh, with a company, Spideo, a startup here in Lund. And Joachim and uh, Rickard looked at uh, two 4K video streams and they wanted to tag when corners occurred, free kicks and kickoffs. And as you can see here, and if you're familiar with uh, machine learning, they did uh, different kinds of uh, uh, neural networks to do this kind of detection. And we also looked at processing speeds for these companies to run this in close to real time. Uh, another one could be together with clinical sciences. We worked with some other researchers. They looked at, um, Alvid looked at deep learning approach for predicting outcome for triple negative breast cancer. So you can imagine you want to detect cells within these images and these are quite large. You can see there are 100,000 pixels and you wanted to build these kind of systems uh, and see how well it worked. Or we can have a more um, society uh, just pure research when we looked at this problem of detecting deep fakes that emerged a couple of years ago in forged videos using deep learning. So people are doing these deep fakes and then you want to detect them. Uh, so Emil looked at different kinds of uh, neural networks, Google Net, Exception Net, Dense Net, and, and uh, recurrent neural networks. So I hope this gives sort of a, a flavor of a machine learning thesis works that we envision. All right, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, and we might, for context, we might uh, say, if this hasn't been clear, the machine learning systems and control master's degree program is is still quite new. I would say. I mean, we we consider it a new program. You you admitted the first students last year, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes, exactly. So we are in the second year has just started. Yeah, the second batch of students. So the first group they will do uh, their thesis work in the spring of 2022. 
and it might look like your examples then. Um, we have a more general question. Oh, sorry, it was actually specific to the production and materials engineering program. Please shed some light on employment opportunities in Sweden after graduating from the production and materials engineering program. Yes, so it's actually quite diverse and uh, opportunities. Uh, if you go, for example, I have some, some students that graduated this summer. Uh, they work as process engineers. Uh, they work with, uh, I have some students that are really interested in, um, I say, automation and robotics and so on. So they work as uh, mechatronic en engineers and consultants. Uh, I have someone that do an internship in product uh, life cycle assessment. Uh, I have some that do PhD student in, uh, uh, or PhD studies in different subjects. One is in materials and another one is in biochemical materials. So it's not, not really related to the program, but they, they had the correct background for these positions, how to say. Um, unfortunately, I would say that the Swedish industry, they are getting more and more open to employ um, international employees. But they are not as good as, for example, Netherlands and, and Belgium and, and so on. But they, they are coming. And they, we have, um, I would say that the, the backside of our program is that we want to work a lot with the process development. They don't need you need to be in the workflow. And if you don't know Swedish, this could be a problem, as you will have said, not only communicate with engineers, you will communicate with the ones that work with purchase customers. Uh, with the uh, operators, with other engineers, uh, and, and so on. And that makes companies sometimes, at least the smaller companies, to be a little more hesitant to not employ someone that doesn't know Swedish. As you never know what you will end up have to do if you need to contact a customer, even if you're a production engineer, there could be some problems and so on. And so I would really recommend you that if you want to work in Sweden and are interested in production materials engineering or, or product realization, learn Swedish. Because then, then you have a really big, big job market. And students in your program can learn Swedish and yes. also can learn Swedish free of charge. So, yes. uh, yes. and that applies to all the two-year master's programs. Uh, whether or not you have time <laughs> to, yes. to actually learn uh, Swedish is a different story. But if you do, the work prospects yes. are better locally, at least, yes. where where they sometimes need uh, their staff members to speak Swedish. Uh, Michael Lentmeyer, can I ask you, because your program, if I am not mistaken, it's probably the oldest of these programs represented here today uh, among our international masters. So you have plenty of people who have been, uh, had, had taken this program and graduated. Um, do you have a, any kind of feeling for the, the work prospects uh, either in Sweden or abroad for your graduates? Yeah, we had uh, many different examples for that, and and I would say the the language problem is most mostly there for smaller companies. For for bigger companies, this is not so much an issue to to speak English. I would say. I mean, if you work for Ericsson, Sony, these companies, yeah, we have access communications. They do uh, video observation and use wireless technologies. This is a typical employer here. We have in town. We have companies in Malmö like Uplox. Um, we have uh, people that go to Cisco. We have people that work yeah, as PhD students in different countries, different places. People that go within Sweden to other cities also. I mean, uh, Ericsson is active in many cities here in, in Sweden. You can go to Stockholm, Linköping, to, to Gothenburg. Volvo cars is something that is coming more and more as uh, hiring engineers from electrical engineering backgrounds, for example, also because communication gets more and more important for future applications. Electrical cars need much more of these uh, knowledges and, and auto, automatic driving is, of course, something that requires uh, such skills as well. Um, I think within companies like Ericsson, there's also a broad uh, range of possible jobs. People can work as more software engineers in baseband development. They can go more towards hardware oriented. Uh, and that can be more on the 
chip design or it can be more towards the RF engineering. And these are all things where also we work closely together with, uh, I mean, we have this other master program at our department, uh, electronics engineering and embedded electronics engineering, which is more hardware related. And we're working close together with our colleagues here. And so in the companies, uh, those things are melting together also in the job market. So. But basically, so you're, you're saying that for large kind of multinational companies, whether or not the empl employee speaks Swedish is not so important, but maybe for smaller uh, companies in Sweden, uh, you, they, are, they can be expected to know some Swedish at least. Yeah, it's, it's better if they can. Yeah. And anyway, I guess, generally speaking, if a person is looking to spend many years in Sweden, it makes sense to learn Swedish anyway. Um, and we can even we can even count the Swedish course as an elective. It's possible to count yeah. it in the credits. Okay, well, Luis, what about your students? Do 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 your graduates say uh, get jobs locally, or do they look abroad? Or um, I have many students that have become need planners at IKEA Elmhult, which is uh, I think 150 kilometers from Lund North. So three of them actually started to share an apartment and work at IKEA and they are from India. So they, I think they work a lot with the Indian suppliers and so on. And uh, more people, uh, more students have been employed at need planners. So they have taken a lot of them. Then we, there is Volvo in Gothenburg that I now have employed one another Indian uh, students as well. So, um, yeah, and the Swedish students uh, that also take this program have, they are, have also got work at IKEA. But then the Swedish students that take the um, other uh, engineering programs, they become consultants a lot. It's very common that they could become consultants. But I haven't heard so many international students become consultants, maybe it's because of the language. But uh, I agree that big companies uh, take uh, master students, international master students, they, they want uh, the, those. So a lot of them have got work here in Sweden, of my students. Mm. And so they come back also to a guest lecture in my- Ah, oh, yes, that's excellent. Work. Yeah, we've heard that from many uh, faculties, actually. That's very interesting. Um, Mikael Nilsson, so your program, is, because it's so new, hasn't produced any graduates yet, uh, but do you have a feel for how the, 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 the job market is in your, in, within machine learning and control uh, theory, etc.? Yeah, I can sort of give a short overview. First, conceptually, what you have is machine learning, and then you typically have some uh, functional application, I would call them, that's like robotics, computer vision. It could be speech processing or, or looking at one dimensional signals or looking at text. And then on, on top of that, you go out to application fields like transportation or telecommunication, as we've mentioned, or agriculture. So what I'm seeing now is sort of machine learning through these functional applications are spreading out to all of these kind of fields in one way or another. And the different application fields have a different maturity for using machine learning or a need for it. And I, I can just give you, I, uh, a year ago or so, I put together just a list of companies that did something in this direction, either from a master thesis work or our, some of our PhD students leaving for some companies. And, and, and uh, I, I, I don't even have all of them here right now. We have one researcher that's at that's Google right now. We have an industrial PhD student at ARM. Um, so, I mean, these things emerge and different companies at different times have these things emerging. And, and we try to sort of pinpoint what's, what each company wants right now and try to match typically the thesis work together with those uh, companies. But it, it spreads uh, quite wide at the moment, I would say. So going back to thesis work, uh, if, if, if I'm a student and I want to uh, do my thesis work while uh, uh, at a company, how, how do you uh, how do you view that? 
do you help the students uh, get some type of position at a company writing their thesis or will the students have to approach them all on their own and and uh, ask for a place uh, at the company to do the thesis writing i guess a lot of companies in the learned region at least are quite used to hosting students for thesis work and or internships uh christina Winmark, what do you say what do you tell your students Yes, I could say it's a little bit different depending on the, the companies. Uh, usually we had quite a lot of, or we still have a, a lot of the opportunities through us with our, I say, partners and the connections we have. But some of the bigger companies, for example, Alfa Laval have made a decision that they will only put on their own homepage and have an open application for all students in, in Europe, more or less to apply for their thesis work. So we cannot provide a, a path into Alpha Laval. They want to, they want to do the assessment themselves uh, of the students. But in at least this year, for example, I think we have about 12 master thesis projects available together with industry. Um, so, and we accept also students that come and have a, a, a position at the company say that I have got a, a project here. Could we make a master thesis? out of it. But then, of course, it could be good to have a, a, a discussion with some of the teachers to make sure that the project actually fits to the program. So it's not something completely outside uh, the program. So are you saying that certain companies will actually advertise this opportunity to... I'll say most, most students, most, all, all the big ones that advertise for master thesis topics. So you, if you go to their career page, you can find master thesis topics there. Hmm, that's very good advice. Uh, Alejandra, your thesis writing is coming up uh, soon. I bet you look forward to it. <laughs> do you have any plans for how to, 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 to do your thesis work? Yes, so our academic coordinator, he gave us like information of several companies looking for students. And that's how I landed two of my interviews and I got accepted into one that's in Gothenburg. Uh, but I know several of my other, several of my classmates, you know, looked for companies here in Sweden or abroad, and they've also gotten placements just by looking on their own. Yeah. So you, you went to their vacancies page and, and looked for positions? No, no. Positions. Yeah, like our academic coordinator, he shared the info, like he shared the emails of the people that we had to um, contact, mm -hmm. and we just you know, some of us just send an email, send our CVs, uh, our letter of motivation, and they contacted us for interviews. Um, yeah, that, that's how we've done it. That's how I did it. Yeah. That's how you did it. But how about the topic of your thesis? I mean, uh, did you come up with that on your own or was it a discussion with the company then? That yeah, so my research interests are around food microbiology and food safety. So I proposed this to the company that I would like to do something around these topics. And they said they would work around that and give me an option to do it in that area. But um, one of my other interests is functional foods, as I said, and the company I had an interview with, they also have certain topics that they propose to the students. And if it's in line with what you wanna do, then you know you're a good fit yeah mm. so it depends like you can you can tell them if you want to do it where you want to do it on which topics and then they'll say yes or no or they can have a topic and then you can say yes or no so i think it's both ways so i, I get the feeling from your answers that it's not really so perhaps i mean of course difficult uh, you have to apply for this and get accepted etc and discuss with the company but this is something that is very common, it seems, among our uh, engineering uh, students. What is common? I'm sorry. Doing a thesis work together or at a company. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that was a, a, a surprise to me because uh, the university I went to, all of our theses were done at the university. Uh, but then uh, when I reached out, when I was looking for, for topics on, 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 on like to do it, and I reached out to different teachers, they said that, they, you know, they already had research topics that they were working on, so they couldn't take any more research. So um, that invites us to reach out to companies. And I think it's better, honestly, because 
we won't necessarily, you know, you don't, you never know if you're going to get a job placement, but it helps us with networking and just being in like a company environment. So I think it's fantastic. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Mikael Nilsson, is that also your take? I mean, this kind of practical experience that students can learn during their thesis writing at a company, is that something that can benefit their career? Um, do they do they typically, I mean, not your current master student, but the previous Swedish student, do they start working at these companies later on? Is that very common? Uh, yes. I mean, it depends. Uh, I would say if I just guessing now, 25% of the uh, students doing a work with that company later get employed. Sometimes there are two students, one get unemployed and one finds another job. So, so I think it, it's good to have this connection with the companies all the time to see the possibilities. Because even if you do the thesis at one place, maybe you met someone else in another context, that you can reach out to. Building this network, I think it's part of your studies in, in a way. And it's, it's good for your future to have different opportunities. Mm. Uh, and I want to mention also, there is this Arcade event where companies come to the university and present what we're doing. And, and I always urge the students, go there and just talk to people and see what they are doing right now if you find something interesting. So yeah, networking is key to in Sweden to 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 find opportunities. I would say for for many people in many businesses or industries. Uh, how Michael Lentmeyer, how do you help your students more like uh, with the post studies, any kind of opportunities and connections with industry that can benefit them? Well, uh, I would say that many of our students really look for a master's degree project in, in industry, but they have to search them themselves mostly. I mean, there are some of these examples where the companies contact us as teachers and ask us to post something. But I would say that the majority, the companies uh, distribute themselves and uh, it, it makes it a bit harder maybe for the students. But at the same time, I say, this is a good exercise for later finding a job. It's the same procedure. I mean, we have to stop getting used to that. Everybody defines everything to us at some point. We have to learn how we can reach out and, and find our way in, in real life, as people say. <laughs> uh, and, and then I also, what, what I do to help is I, I mean, we have every year an information session where I talk about how to do this, how to find topics, how the rules are. And one thing I always point out is this list of previous degree projects that we have as a database. You can basically look back the last 20 years and see all the degree projects and all the theses you can download and you can see where people have worked earlier. So this is a good indicator of which companies might be available for offering some topics. Mm. And I guess since your program has been running for a very long time, the, a lot of alum, alumni or working already in industry and are very familiar with the pro program and the well the department perhaps oh yes mm. uh louise would you like to say a few words about that are you i know you mentioned ikea yeah. <laughs> many of your uh, international students have gone on to 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 work for a bit if they the thesis uh, writing and when you find a topic for your thesis is that often done in collaboration with the private sector companies yeah, yeah, very often. So, but if the students can't find a company, we will help them to discuss a subject so that they can do it um, with us only as a, like a supervisor, so not, not with a supervisor from a company. So then they also can go out and do interviews and collect data, but it's not connected to a company. But usually they, uh, they, the students do it together with a company and we try to make them um, uh, find companies. So my boss, for example, he uh, sends out these 150 uh, emails to different companies and ask if they have uh, any jobs uh, as to do master thesis. And then he has a list and then we also get ads and the, we tell students to look at the ads for a master's thesis. 
So, but the students have to do a lot themselves. So we help them that they should uh, write this one pager on what is the recent uh, within logistics and how could this help their company and ask if they are interested. And we say, you have to send out to a lot of companies and use LinkedIn, use your network uh, and all that. So, so yeah, we support them to, to search for theses. Mm. Maybe one or two uh, do it with the division also. So it is a little bit like uh, applying for a job, basically. Yes, yes. So we have a question here uh, from uh, directed to production and materials engineering. Uh, does production and materials engineering program have any industrial visits throughout the course for students to understand current research taking place in industry? Yes, we have. So I usually, um, when we start a program, I usually have an activity before before the start of the courses, we will go for an industrial visit. Uh, we have one course that's called Global Product Realization that I am one of the course teachers. And in that course, we visit between uh, something, now it's a little bit special year because many campuses are still not open, but this year we will have eight visits. Usually we may have maybe 12, 12 visits in, in that course to understand better how do companies actually organize themselves why do they locate where they locate and, and so on. And we have some focus groups that they are, I say, focus on and asking questions in a specific area. And then of course, we also have other courses that also have study visits. But I could say due to 2019 and 2020, has not been in a good year to do study visits. But we hope that we can start this again because it's, a, I think it's a great opportunity to see the practice of what you learn in the courses. Excellent. Anyone else? Uh, do you have industry visits or do you invite people from industry to to uh, hold guest lectures to a large degree? Mikael Nilsson, is it common in your department to to have this type of collaboration or visits? Yeah, it happens. I, I can mention briefly uh, in my machine learning course, we had a researcher from Semseact that previous well, uh, Senuity, but doing this self-driving uh, for Volvo and Autoliv. For example, um, but also we had this event where sort of companies comes and, and give some ideas more, more like we want to look at this and we want help. Uh, we also have other researchers. We had a researcher from uh, from Germany coming in and having a guest lecture on a specific uh, topic. So, so it's a bit of a mixed ball and it would depend on which course you attend and so forth. But, but it does happen. Mm. Anyone else want to weigh in here? Uh, wireless, uh, do you want to say a few words about this? Uh, industry visits or guest lectures from industry? Yeah, I, I, I would say, like Mika says, it happens. It's not, it's not regular, I would say, but when there is opportunity, then, then we, we will use it. Um, we, we did have earlier some course which was only designed for designed for having guest lectures, a total course. Uh, but it has to run in the in the evenings, and now it's hard to find teachers that actually are available for for doing that. So this this has been maybe even more active in the past. We have to probably think about how to replace this with other activities. Okay, uh, I think actually that is. A, it's close to 4 p.m. here in Sweden, and we, we unfortunately do not have more time to talk with our programs in engineering and technology. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the panelists for joining us here today and provide their information and, and guidance and, and tips uh, for uh, you know what students can expect if they join us here at Lund University to study engineering. Um, so thank you all, Christina, Michael, Michael and Michael, <laughs> Luis and Alejandra for joining us here today and providing help and insight. Um, and I would also like to tell the remaining participants that there are many other events, virtual events happening this week, our online application week. Uh, so please do join uh, any and all future events that you are interested in. But I think that's it from us today. So thanks everyone for joining and have a nice afternoon and evening.